Hello to all the TDT readers, uh, or in this case, viewers. I'm Alethea Braganza, and I'm joined by Todd Ross Neenkirk. Todd is the CEO, owner, and co-founder of Four Kitchens. He has had a long list of contributor roles to his name and is an active member of the Drupal community. Hi, Todd. Thank you for taking the time to sit with TDT. Absolutely. Happy to. Uh, as an active member of uh, the Drupal community, um, uh, would you be able to tell us, uh, or do you recall your first Drupal encounter? And you know about remember the first time where you thought to yourself, okay, uh, it could be Drupal from here on. Uh, that's a great question. Um, so, I co-founded Four Kitchens in two thousand six with three other people, uh, David Strauss, Aaron Stonish, and Kristen Hillary. Uh, we started as a publishing company. So we, we launched a, a paper in Austin, Texas, and we were looking for a CMS to build the website in. And uh, we had just graduated university. Uh, we had no money, no investment. We, we were doing everything ourselves. Uh, and so we knew that that we would have to use a free and open source CMS to, to build this website. Um, I had taught myself WordPress at that point, but WordPress was still pretty young and was really best suited for blogs at that time. So what we wanted to do was launch a paper, like a magazine, something much, much more um, complex than a, a blog. Uh, so WordPress didn't feel like the good fit, feel like a good fit at, at the time. Uh, so we we actually built the first version of uh, this website in MediaWiki, which is the open source CMS that powers uh, Wikipedia. Uh, it, kind of an odd choice in, in retrospect. It's a complicated CMS that is really just built to run Wikipedia. Uh, but we we built this site and we hadn't launched it yet. We were two weeks out from uh, from launching the site and David Strauss approached me and said, hey, uh, I think we need to switch CMSs. And I thought, we're two weeks away from launching this thing and you want to completely rebuild the site. Um, there must be a very compelling reason why you would want to do that. But, um, you know, I, I trusted him and I'm uh, glad I did. But he, uh, he said that he had found this thing called Drupal. And it it seemed like it had a, a more vibrant community. Uh, it, it was better suited to run a publishing site the way that we wanted to run one. So we switched and we spent those two weeks completely rebuilding the site and moving all of the content from MediaWiki into Drupal. And that was, uh, that was in 2006, that was Drupal version 4.7.2. And as a result of, of uh, building this rather complicated site at the time, uh, we had to uh, write a lot of custom modules and, and uh, make some contributions to core. And uh, we just very, very quickly became experts in, in Drupal because we had to build this complicated site that, that we were running ourselves. Uh, and that experience really showed me that um, that is probably the CMS that we were gonna be using for a long time. And also getting to know the community at that point. Um, the Media Wiki community wasn't as, mm -hmm. I don't know, it was just a different feeling. You know, the WordPress community has a different feeling. Um, they're not bad or, or less than, they're just different. Uh, they have different business models. Uh, but Drupal really felt like a, a genuinely fun and great uh, version or a great group of people uh and we were really excited to to get involved at, at that point yeah uh, drupal does have quite a strong uh community um but uh, also of course uh your social media platforms uh do talk about your background i think you had uh, i think a degree in communications that is radio a film as well as psychology uh what inspired you to switch over to tech I've always been interested in 
technology and in the web. Um, I started building websites in probably 1994, 1995, when I was uh, in middle school and high school. Um, that was, you know, that was back in the day of like GeoCities and mm -hmm. Tripod and, and like free website platforms like that. It was also at a time when if you had a subscription to a dial up internet service provider, sometimes they give you a little bit of space on their web server, like two megabytes, and you could put stuff on whatever you wanted to put on there. Um, so I started making websites for myself and, and for my friends. And uh, again, publishing was was really when it started and, and how we, I got started with that. Um, I created uh, like an underground zine, uh, an alternative to the student newspaper at my high school. Um, and was able to set up like a newsletter system. This is back before like MailChimp or anything like that. None of that existed at, at that point. Um, so it, it was a creative outlet, like learning the technology was a way to um, be creative technically, but also to publish uh, writing and photography and stories and, and things like that, stuff that I was interested in, in doing uh, in my spare time. And it was fun also to have people read that stuff and and mm -hmm. talk to me in person about you know the websites I had built and uh, the the stories and articles that that we had published. Um, it was really rewarding to to know that people were actually seeing this and they were seeing it because of the internet because they had access to that. Um, so when I went to university, I started in computer science, um, but I very quickly became disillusioned with that that program. I went to the, the University of Texas at Austin. It has a very good computer science program, but I was interested in the internet. Uh, and what they were teaching in computer science was all academic, uh, theoretical computer science. It wasn't applied computer science. It wasn't engineering. Uh, and when I asked my professors and, and the, the dean of the program, uh, when are you going to start offering some classes that uh, uh, touch on the internet or that have internet related technologies? And uh, I was told that the internet is not programming. Oh. So I realized these people uh, are kind of dinosaurs. They're not following technology. Uh, they aren't paying attention to what's relevant. Uh, and I realized that if, if I, I would have to teach myself all of this stuff on the side if I wanted to learn it. If I wanted to learn PHP and JavaScript and all of these things, I'd have to do it on my own time. So then I thought, if I have to learn that on my own time, I should study something that I'm genuinely interested in because I'm not genuinely interested in uh, calculating, um, you know, the the number of of like loops that can be processed in a millisecond or, or uh, these languages like assembly and scheme and Lisp and, and all of these like esoteric uh, machine level academic languages. That's just wasn't very interesting to me. So I, I left the uh, computer science program and I enrolled in psychology and in radio television film, which is like mass media. So I have two degrees, psychology and, and media. Uh, and I didn't know it at the time, but it turned out that those two areas of study are really relevant to what we do on the internet, because psychology is about, in part, uh, how people perceive information and perceive the world and how they interact with it and other people. Media, mass media, is about how information is broadcast to large audiences and how people receive information through different channels. So it could be film or radio or television or the internet or podcasts or whatever. So it, I, I didn't intend to, to study these things through the lens of building websites professionally, but it turned out that knowing how people interact with each other and how people receive information at scale is very relevant to making websites and working on the internet. I mean, uh, definitely it did work out for the best. I love that decision that you made. 
And I do agree that psychology ha- plays its roles in many different sectors. Um, you know, uh, coming to four kitchens, um, I think I'm also interested about knowing about the timeline of four kitchens. Could you tell us a little bit about, especially from the establishment, and also uh, what was that moment that um, made you understand that okay, it's kind of taking off from here. So we, uh, when we first started Four Kitchens, we we thought we would be a publishing company. So we wanted to launch a, a paper in Austin. Um, all four of us had met at the University of Texas where we, uh, we worked on the student humor publication. So it was like mm-hmm. satire comedy. Uh, and that's what we enjoyed doing. So as we all started to graduate, we thought, well, that's a lot of fun. We wanna, what if we could turn that into a job? Uh, so we had nothing to lose because we had no money and the jobs that some of us had, we didn't particularly like. Uh, so we decided to, to launch this paper and we had to learn web design along the way, web, web development and design, um, in order to, to build the websites for these things. Cause we couldn't hire people to do it. We had, we had no money. And that, that time period that we were in school which for me was 2000 to 2005. And for some of of us, some of the other co-founders, it was like 2002 to 2006 or so. Um, That timeframe is when CMSs were invented, essentially. So before the year 2000, uh, it was flat HTML files or desktop programs like Dreamweaver, where you would write in HTML or edit something through WYSIWYG and then it would upload HTML files to a server. Uh, in that period where we were in school and not really paying attention to, you know, how web design was evolving, uh, that's when things like Drupal and WordPress and MediaWiki were invented. So when we graduated, we had to learn all of that stuff all over again. So it was like a completely different internet by the time we, we graduated. Um, the time, the moment that we realized like this was really the probably the future of the company uh, was after launching the the website for the the paper uh we started to get some attention within the drupal community because this uh this website looked really really good it was really well designed and it was kind of complicated it was one of the larger drupal sites on the web at the time we didn't know that but um it didn't it didn't look like a drupal site it didn't look or act or feel like a drupal site at that point and it got some attention as a result because this is back before people were doing really creative, interesting things in the front end. Um, everybody was still kind of figuring out what Drupal was going to be and how it was going to work. And um, as a result of building this site that looked really good, uh, we started getting calls from people who were running their own Drupal sites or companies that had Drupal sites or publishers that had Drupal sites. Uh, and they asked us if we designed that. And we said, yes. And they said, well, we need help with ours. Would you be willing to to help with our Drupal site? And we needed to pay the bills. Uh, And so we we started doing a little bit of web design and consulting and things like that on the side. But very quickly, we realized this is the business. And Four Kitchens shifted from being a publishing company to being a, uh, a web agency and helping other publishers and now nonprofits and universities and, and all kinds of organizations build websites for themselves. Uh, from what you just told me, it does, does seem like Four Kitchens was always ahead of its time. And uh, especially at the time where I think CMS was still starting out. So there's definitely a considerable um, you know, difference now, especially um, post pandemic. Uh, Four Kitchens had quite a, uh, acquired uh, Manati. And uh, could you tell us a little bit about that and how it strengthened Four Kitchens? Sure. <clears throat> well, so there, there have actually been two mergers and, and acquisitions uh, in the past few years. So in 2021, we merged with Advomatic. Where is it there? Mm-hmm. That's Advomatic. We merged with Advomatic. Uh, Advomatic had been around even before Four Kitchens uh, and very involved in the Drupal community. Um, Advomatic uh, is very well known for working with uh, advocacy organizations, nonprofits, um, labor unions, um, and also some universities. Uh, and that um, 
that aligned really nicely with work that we were already doing at Four Kitchens. We, we kind of got our start in publishing, but over the years, we had taken on more and more higher education and nonprofit clients. And we saw this as, as, a, um, as just a really nice complementary um, merger uh, mm -hmm. of our clients and our skills. Uh, so that happened in 2021. And in 2022, we made the decision to uh, expand internationally to build our team outside of, of the US and Canada. Uh, and we had a long time friendship with uh, Beto and Lou at Manatee. And uh, we had talked about maybe doing something like this in the past, but the time wasn't right. Um, I, I honestly didn't really have a good understanding of, of how that would work, or I, I didn't really have the right vision for it years ago. But after merging with Advomatic and understanding how that process works, uh, we, we then decided this would be a, a, a good time to do it. And we had the experience to, to do it. Uh, so I reached out to Beto and Lou, and we started to have a conversation in 2022. And uh, we finalized the acquisition on October 1st of last year. Thank you for telling me about Manatee. Manatee, yes. Um, I think uh, quite recently, uh, Four Kitchens underwent a rebranding. And mm -hmm. uh, these were your words in, in the blog post where it says, we're more capable and diverse, larger than ever, yet our brand has remained the same. It no longer reflects who we are or who we want to be. What was the target behind this rebranding and in what aspects has Four Kitchens yet remained the same? Great question. Um, so the reason, there were a few reasons why we wanted to rebrand and what rebranding means is not just changing the logo it's changing how you talk about what you do uh and how you talk to uh the the people that you want to hire and the people you want to work with as clients uh so it's it's how you sound and it's how you look and it's how you present yourself to the world it's not just a, a logo um so uh what we needed to do at that point, because we we had merged with Advomatic, we had acquired Manatee, and uh, we had expanded our business into other areas that that um, we had been working in for years, like nonprofits. But mm -hmm. most people knew us because of the work we've done with large media companies like The Economist or Time Inc. or Meredith or NBC, like these massive media conglomerates. And we, we aren't doing that much work with those kinds of organizations anymore. Uh, that work has moved towards proprietary TMSs and, and business models and, and tools that we don't use internally. I'm not saying they're bad, that we just don't support them. We're not the right fit for those organizations anymore. So we've been shifting more and more of our work into higher education and nonprofits. Uh, and with the, with the shift in our business and the addition of these team members and our expansion internationally and all of this stuff that had happened, we were just a totally different company. Uh, we, we, you know, felt different on the inside and we were doing a different, we were doing different kinds of work uh, publicly. Uh, and, and we wanted, we, we saw this as an opportunity to not only realign how we talk about ourselves to potential clients and to bring in more of those clients that we want to work with, but also to kind of hit the reset button uh, internally with our team and say, you know, half, roughly half of the team at that point had joined Four Kitchens through a different company, through Advomatic or through Manatee. And something like 75% of the company had joined Four Kitchens since 2020. So it, it was like a, a, basically a brand new team. So we wanted to hit the reset button on the brand. And, and by that, I mean, we wanted to, we wanted the opportunity for everybody to contribute to building this new Four Kitchens. And part of that is changing how we present ourselves to the world, how we talk about ourselves and how we look. So by starting over, essentially, starting with a new logo and a new way of speaking, everybody, regardless of how long they were at Four Kitchens, had an equal opportunity to build this new company. 
the mission and vision does uh, of four kitchens does uh, resonate um another thing uh, qu question that i did have was has the name four kitchens caused a little confusion and um why is four kitchens called four kitchens great question um so i realize i didn't uh i didn't answer part of your your first question there but this will actually answer that um so some of the things that have remained the same we still work with the same kinds of clients that we have been for years universities nonprofits trade unions um non-advertising publishers public media all of that we still work with all of those organizations and our underlying um, mission, vision, purpose, and core values have not changed. Mm -hmm. Our name didn't change in the in the rebranding. So all of those things remain the same. We also kept the color green. So when we went to uh, the branding agency that we worked with called Focus Lab, we told them that the only thing we didn't want to change was the color green and that we wanted to hear their suggestions about anything else including the name uh, and very quickly they came back and said we don't want to change the name we won't change the name we won't change the color green everything else is going to change uh, and that's because the uh the origin story of four kitchens and how we got our name really speaks to our culture and uh our values and um how we like to work with each other in the company and, and with our clients so where the name came from uh when we were first getting started when it was me and kristen and aaron and david we were basically all living together because we some of us had jobs some of us didn't uh we were all living and working out of a, a, an apartment uh and we were looking for some additional space because we knew we wanted to bring in we were running this paper right so we we needed writers and photographers and illustrators we needed a whole collection of people to help us do this thing uh and so we know we we knew we needed more space uh so we started looking around for places where we could maybe work and we were at the same time we were also attending all of these meetups so we went to some open source meetup somewhere in Austin and we met this guy who had built a co-working space outside of town. Uh, it wasn't called a co-working space then because the concept of co-working didn't exist as a word, but that's what it was. Uh, but he built this, this place outside of town and we went and visited it. And it was this really like unusual structure that I think he had probably built himself. But it was this big like building with all of these different work areas and living areas in them uh and it had like a really fast internet connection which at the time was a big deal because that was hard to find uh, but what was interesting about the space was it had four separate living areas each with its own kitchen and there were four founders so we this just felt like oh this is a place where we can live and work we didn't actually wind up moving into this place or working out of this place. We, we found someplace else to be, but we really liked the concept of calling the company Four Kitchen Studios, which was the original name, uh, because it was a reference to all living and working together, being creative and scrappy uh, and just making cool stuff as a team. Uh, and that, has been at the core of, of why we got started. It's why all four of us met at the University of Texas. It's why uh, we worked together for so many years. And, uh, and so the name stuck. So the name means being collaborative, being creative, uh, and, and working together on, on big projects that, um, that consume a lot of our, our energy in a good way and that give us, uh, that give us creative energy. I think it's such a, a beautiful story to tell. Um, I, I'm going to be moving on a little bit towards uh, your work with Drupal in terms of as a presenter, as a volunteer, especially at Drupal events and Drupal cons. Um, um, what, what does it mean to you to be able to participate and how would you encourage others to do that as well? Uh... Well, I, I have to admit that my personal participation in the Drupal community and project has 
has scaled back over the years. Uh, and that's because I've, I've shifted more of my attention into the agency community. So we got started in Drupal um, for, I don't know, maybe the first 15 years doing this. I, I spent a lot of time volunteering at events, helping to run events, speaking at Drupal events, all of that. But over the past few years, I've started to shift some of that energy into the community of agency owners and operators um, because there's there's a really positive trend in that space uh, mm -hmm. of agency owners adopting some of the ideals of open source. So transparency, collaboration, community. Um, it's been really nice to see a world that used to be very competitive uh, start to open up a bit more. And so I'm, I'm really, I'm spending more of my time over there uh, currently. But when I was actively, like very actively involved in the, in the Drupal community, and 4Kitchen still is as, as a company, you know, there are lots of people on our team that are involved in the day-to-day -day, uh, and, and in specific initiatives and, and, and contributing modules and all of that. Uh, so we are still very active as a company, just personally. I'm not, I'm not as active as I used to be. Um, I think that, that open source is, is just sort of deeply human. Uh, I think that we are, we are social creatures and mm -hmm. open source is a, is a framework to be social with, uh, the technology that we build and our ideas. So being able to freely, um, in every sense of the word, share our work and our, um, and our ideas and uh, innovations is just important as humans, but uh, it's also really good for business. Um, I think that it's, a, it's, it's much more interesting to me to focus on the services side of working with clients and not the product side. Mm -hmm. So if, if we were working with a proprietary CMS like Adobe or whatever, we would be spending a lot of time trying to sell our clients that product first, and then the customizations and the services and all of that after we've sold them the product. But in the world of, of open source, you still have to tell people about like the, the pros and cons of open source platforms like Drupal versus Adobe or versus WordPress or whatever. There's still a little bit of selling that you have to do of the platform, but you get to very quickly move on to, all right, here's what we're going to do. Like we've, we've, we don't need to sell you the thing as much as we need to tell you why we are the best fit for working with you and for customizing this thing that you want to build this on. That's really appealing to me because it 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 we just move so much faster into the valuable and creative and um, business outcome oriented part of the work faster than if we were um, having to spend our time selling a product and then setting it up as an afterthought almost. I know that's probably that's maybe not a fair thing to say for people who work in those other platforms, but um, at a high level, that's how it feels to me. Um, and I, I think that, that just knowledge fundamentally um, should be free. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's actually a core part of the Four Kitchens mission and has been since, uh, since day one. Um, our, our mission is to set knowledge free. So we do that by working with open source platforms, by sharing our knowledge, uh, speaking at events, writing blog posts, doing webinars, creating a podcast. Um, yes, all of that helps our, our business and attracts clients to the, the kind of work and expertise that we provide. But it's also very genuinely an effort to help other people learn and to share what we have learned with the world. Uh, I, I just kind of deeply have, I, I have some very deep issues with the way that that um, we as a culture, and by that I, I guess I mean in the United States, maybe the rest of the world is like this too, but the way that we try to control ideas through 
patents and trademark and copyright and things like that. I think that those are important to an extent, but I think that that gets abused. And I think we would all be better off if there were a bit more transparency with knowledge and a bit more freedom to be able to use knowledge. Like, I don't think ideas can be owned, but there are some aspects of US patent law that would say otherwise. Um, that's my soapbox. <laughs> well, uh, it's a beautiful way to end that answer. But I think my last question to wrap up uh, this conversation would be, well, of course, today you are the CEO of Hope Kitchens, uh, but there was a time when you were just starting out. To, uh, would, do you have any kind of words of advice towards anyone, regardless of age, starting out, especially not just the do's, but you know the don'ts as well? Yeah, I have a lot. Um, let me let me try to be brief. Uh, well, let's see. I have a lot to say about that. I'll I'll yeah. just pick a few things. Yeah, sure. Just, um, just do because it's do it uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think the first thing is. My perspective is um, from client services. So we, we have almost always been a client service company. We, we build things for other people in other companies. Mm -hmm. And if that's the kind of business you want to get into, then um, it, you could be an independent contractor. You could start an agency. You could work with one or two other people. There's lots of different ways you can do that. My first piece of advice would be do it. Mm -hmm. uh, don't be afraid to do it. Um, it, it will be scary and it will be stressful and there will be times when you maybe regret it, but, um, it's really valuable. Uh, the freedom that you get, uh, mm -hmm. running, running your own business, um, or being, you know, an independent contractor and being independent. Um, that's super rewarding. The other side of that coin is, is the uncertainty and the stress that, that can come along with that. Uh, and so my second piece of advice is you need to figure out how to manage your stress. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are, I mean, there are literally hundreds or thousands of books in the world about how to manage stress. And it can range from, you know, therapy to yoga, to exercise, to, you know, all, people do all kind of travel, read a book. There are all kinds of things people do to, to manage stress. But you need to figure out the things that work for you, um, because this job can really be heavy uh, at, at times, especially when the economy isn't good or you're dealing with things like mm -hmm. a pandemic and you feel the weight of everybody's jobs on, on your shoulder. Um, next piece of advice would be um, it's easier to specialize. So if you go into the world saying, I want to make websites and you are willing to make websites for anybody and everybody, then um, it's actually going to be harder for you in the long run. You're not going to be able to make as much money. You are going to be competing against many more people and companies. Um, you need to have a focus. You need to really understand the kinds of clients you're working with, the type of work that you do, the technologies or techniques that you employ, the smaller the, the specialization, yeah. the better off you will actually be in the long run. Um, I think that like Four Kitchens is, is not super specialized, like we're, we're pretty specialized, but I've, I've met other agencies that just do very specific things. And as a result, their sales pipeline is always full because they're the only ones in the world that do this kind of thing for these kinds of companies. And they all line up to, to work with them. Uh, and you have to, that's also something you have to constantly refine because the market's mm -hmm. always changing and technologies are always changing. So what you specialize in now probably won't be 
what you specialize in five years from now. So you also have to be thinking ahead to, well, we're doing this now. How long is this going to last? What's the next thing we need to specialize in? And life will, it'll be harder at first to, to specialize, but life will get a lot easier in the long run if you narrow the work that you do rather than try to expand it. Well, thank you for that advice. Specialization, yes, got it. I, I should take that advice for myself as well. Um, thank you so much, uh, Todd, for giving us your time. It has definitely been an insightful conversation for me and for TTT. We wish you well. Thank you once again and have a good day again. A good day ahead. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> this thank is you. me, Alicia, uh, signing out. Goodbye.